Wild Fed is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Check out SirThrival.com for a full line of nutritional support products. Now's a good time of year to start thinking about building up your immune system as we head into winter. Sir Thrival's line of medicinal mushroom formulas are the best in the industry and their colostrum product. And you know, colostrum has been shown to have very broadly antiviral properties, including against the flu. Uh, it's part of my daily morning smoothie. It's the ingredient that I use to tie everything together. It's also a good time of year to invest in a vitamin D formula as we descend into the darker part of the year. And Sir Thrival has an excellent vitamin D3. So check that out as well. You can find it all at SirThrival.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Welcome to episode four of the Wild Fed podcast. I've got a really fun episode today with the forager chef, Alan Burgo. I'll tell you about that in a moment, but first, I'd like to start off by thanking you for the incredible reception of episodes one through three last week as we launched this show. To everyone who took the time to leave us a five-star rating and review, you are tremendously, tremendously appreciated. Uh, it's always amazing to me how many people want to consume your media, but how few people will actually just take a moment to go over and leave you that rating. So if you did, thank you. And if you haven't yet, please go ahead and leave us that five-star rating and review. Here's why. It helps people find the show by boosting our ratings, our rankings, so that people see the show is there. It increases the likelihood that new guests want to come on the show because they see how engaged you are as an audience, and that makes them more eager to come share here. And it also helps us generate advertiser interest, which is crucial to the long-term funding of the show. Um, we'll keep delivering these shows to you each week, and all we ask in return is for that rating and review. Also, I want to give a shout out to everyone who pre-ordered season one of the Wild Fed TV show or signed up for the Wild Fed season one experience, our upcoming nine week program. Remember, if you sign up for season one of the show, you'll get the first 30 minute episode delivered to you on January 6th with a new episode delivered each week for a total of eight 30 minute episodes. If you sign up for the program, you'll also receive the first episode on January 6th, but you'll be getting the bonus director's cuts, which will be a deeper dive into the episode, the gear and the techniques we use, stories from behind the scenes, and conversations related to the activities of that particular episode. Um, plus, you'll be part of the nine live Q&As that we'll be doing, and you'll be enrolled in the private member group. So if you're new to this lifestyle or just wanting to go deeper, or if you're seasoned in this lifestyle but just want to be part of this community, please consider joining us. You can find all those details at wild-fed.com. Sales for the program close on January 5th, so go ahead and get signed up today. This show was recorded at 8 a.m. That's a lot earlier than I like to do uh, podcasts most of the time, but we made it work. Um, we were in a small camper just in the, the town of Menominee, Wisconsin. If I understand it correctly, Menominee is the Algonquin word for the wild rice people, which I found auspicious for our time there. We were visiting with Alan Burgo, shooting an episode for season two of the Wild Fed TV show, focusing on foraging with him uh, and also on hunting rock doves or the common pigeon. During that visit, I absolutely fell in love with pigeons as a species, you know, their natural history, their life history, uh, but also, of course, as a food. Uh, Alan was an outstanding host, and we learned a lot from him, both as a forager, but also as a chef. So his web domain and social media handle of Forager Chef is really appropriate for him. I can't wait for you to see that episode, but in the meantime, I know you'll really enjoy this interview. Uh, also, I can't wait to hear what you think, so please leave me some feedback on my Instagram page at Daniel Vitalis or over at, at wild.fed on Instagram uh, or on the blog page associated with this interview at wild-fed.com. Thank you for listening, and as always, I'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode of the Wild Fed podcast. We're here in Menominee. Am I saying that right? Menominee? Menominee, as Menominee. in Menomen, as in wild rice. Yeah. So uh, Menominee, Wisconsin, named for wild rice. Yes. So that must be an Anishinaabe, I think, probably. I, we I can't probably even speak go to there. it. But the point is, the name <laughs> is, is derived from wild rice. Uh, I'm here with our producer, Grant Giuliano. Good early morning to everybody. It is early. And, of course, the illustrious Chef Alan Burgo. Good morning, everybody. Alan uh, has hosted us here in Menominee for the last week. 
to uh, film an episode of Wild Fed and uh, put a dinner on. This has been a really good time, Alan. Thanks for having us out. Yeah, it's been great. Um, let's start off a little bit by just talking about uh, what you do, man. I mean, you're a pretty interesting character because you, you have a website, foragerchef.com, right? That's the domain? Yes. Which is uh, well, just what it sounds like, actually. How'd you get that domain? Nobody, had, they didn't have to buy that from somebody or? I, I lucked out. I, I looked out available. and I got that. I got the trademark and it was just, it was a long time ago. You know, I was a l- enough ahead of the curve to, uh, to not have to fight for it too much. Man, we're wild. Dashfed.com. <sighs> so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. They, they want there, 50 K for the domain we want. <laughs> I know. It's mm-hmm. like, ouch. Uh, but anyway, um, so you are uh, a chef and a forager, obviously, that, as the name implies. But tell us a little bit. Give us a little background, a little backstory so we get a sense of who you are. Yeah. Well, I had always worked in restaurants. First, first, I was really a chef. And I spent a good 15 years in the restaurant industry, you know, just starting as a line cook working in crappy restaurants and then working up in slightly okay restaurants. I worked, uh, first, my passion was Italian food, worked with a, a chef who owned his own restaurant in Rome for 10 years. Then I worked for the former personal chef to the Princess of Monaco. Then I worked for a chef from Milan. Then I worked for a master butcher from Rome. Then I was at another Italian restaurant. Then I started getting into kind of the local food scene and the farm to table restaurants. Where were you then? Uh, that Kind of the biggest one was Heartland. When I helped open up the new Heartland, we were nominated for the Beard uh, six years in a row. Wow! With uh, Lenny Russo, so we didn't use any products that came from greater than 200 miles of Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So no olive oil, no citrus. You want pasta on your station? You got to make it, and we change the menu every single day. And we're the guys on the line. Uh, were the ones making up the menu every day. Wow. We'd walk through the coolers, chef did the ordering and stuff like that, talk to purveyors and just be a celebrity. And then we would go through the coolers, see all this amazing stuff. Every day was new. And it was a creative... There, there'll never be another restaurant like it because the creative uh, freedom given to the cooks is just really unprecedented where you have some, you have people come in and it's just like, let's just create. And yeah. every day we'd come in, I'd come in two, three hours early just so I could create whatever I wanted and that kind of freedom without having to be the chef running a restaurant. It, it gives a sort of genesis to the food that you don't see where sometimes the stars just align and you have things that are just, just incredible Right. on the other side of things. Some people aren't as talented as other folks. <laughs> and sometimes there's like, yeah. you know, 30 gallons of candied red onions that he cut with the grain instead of against the grain, and you got to throw them all away. Talk about old, old, old sous chef who like to experiment too much. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, I, I imagine, I know if, um, let's say that uh, occasionally, if I'm not writing a lot, I'll occasionally write something great, you know, and occasionally not. Um, if I write and I make myself write every single day, lots of good material comes out of that. Some garbage too, because sometimes I'm just doing filler. But when you're forced to be creative, but on a regular schedule, uh, man, it's like uh, going to the gym, right? You make tremendous gains. So I imagine during that time where you kind of had to be creative every day, you had to innovate every single day, it must have pushed your culinary skill quite a ways. Uh, off the charts. I yeah. mean, from like a, uh, like a creative genesis standpoint to being able to just walk into a place and say, okay, I have no idea what the menu is going to be today. We need two three-course tasting menus. We need four entrees. And we need four sides and possibly dessert if I'm feeling frisky for wow. a vegan tasting menu. And then all of that would get created that day. Wow. Everything. Wow. And one, I mean, one single entree, it, I mean, in when times I was being a little hard on myself, I might have, you know, five, six, seven components on one single dish. Mm-hmm. Now multiply that by eight dishes. Yeah. It's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot of work. Yeah. A lot of planning. Yeah. But yeah, from a creative standpoint, it kind of it, it pushed me into a into a different realm where I just I just wanted to be creating just all the time. So then after after Heartland, I went and ran two restaurants uh, by myself, and they closed. Like the restaurant industry is it is cutthroat. It is super competitive, and the comp- the competition is super super tough right now. And it's hard. It, you don't have to be a good cook. It's not just enough. To, to cook really well, 
it's all sorts of other things. And I, I learned a lot of really, really good lessons, but that was kind of my, my chef experience. I started getting interested in wild food uh, a little bit before Heartland when I would see that the most expensive things coming into restaurants was the stuff coming in the back door. We had this one guy who would bring in mushrooms. He was retired and he bought himself a plane so he could fly around the country to his mushroom spots and just bring us whatever <laughs> he could find. And I was like, this guy is living the life of Riley. Like, this is so cool. Wow. And, you know, he's not making money. That's one thing that people think, like, the, the people that actually make money selling wild food are, is very small. You know, you have to have a large, you have to kind of industrialize the process a little bit and, you know, hire people and do things like that uh, to, there's get, a, there's, to scale it up to actually make any money. There's not a lot of money in it per se, unless you're, you know, part of the commercial organizations. There's like a, a sense of kind of wonder and magic. There's like this sort of elfin realm kind of vibe going on when people are into foraging. And then I imagine a lot of that starts to get lost when you industrialize it to that level, because, you know, it's like when you, when you put market prices on things and you have to start to, um, yeah, you just probably, I imagine it, it loses a little bit of the charm that pe initially draws people into it. And some sort sort of standardization, I mean, you kind of need, um, like with plants right now, it's kind of like the wild west as far as regulation goes. Uh, with mushrooms, I sat on a, a kind of a advisory committee to advise the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the Minnesota Department of Health on like what should mushroom laws be. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like eight or nine years ago, and we don't have laws yeah. for this. Like, what what do we even do? Like, this stuff's going into restaurants, and kind of the fear is like, oh, someone's going to eat an Amanita bisporgeria. Uh, Bisporgeria or something in the Phylloidus group, the destroying angels. So people are going to die. There's right. going to be death. Right, right. Not a single person. That's, yeah. You know, yeah. so. But it is an interesting component, I imagine, that the, uh, the forager brings in the ingredient and then the chef or cook takes that ingredient and that chef or cook doesn't necessarily have the identification skills to know one way or the other what they're, they're going on faith. And totally. Like, when we watched you bring in those <clears throat> ingredients to the chef. You had to explain to him most of the things that you were bringing. Yeah, it seemed like he knew the stuff that you had brought him before. So he'd be like, oh, yeah, I love these. So you were yes. giving him a lot of input, yeah, ideas, well, what he could do. Maybe I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit and <clears throat> tell about what I'm doing. So after after my last restaurant closed, I decided to just do take up a couple consulting projects and uh, finally sold my book, sold my book proposal. But in the meantime, uh, the first book's on plants. It's a three-part series, uh, Flora, Fungi, and Fauna. And the first one's on plants, so I'm going around collecting all these plants and doing recipe development. And I was like, shoot, maybe I should work with a restaurant if I'm going to be going around getting all these crazy plants that, you know, chefs have never even, they've never even, they can't even dream of them. Uh, I should give them to someone and figure out a way so that they could pay me and make it worth my time, kind of, uh, and, and still get, you know, get some press out of it and and try to work something around like that. So I'm bringing ingredients to one restaurant. I do it basically just pick whatever I want every week. And then, yeah, I have to tell them, basically tell them what to do with this stuff. Cause just because a chef, you know, we kind of think, Oh, they're chef. They, they work in restaurants. They serve food all the time. Just because you work with food all the time does not mean that you know how to cook with wild ingredients. It's like, I, like, I like to say, having me come to a restaurant is like plugging an alien hard drive into your computer. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what's going to happen. There, there's going to be a lot of failure. Uh, some stuff you're, you're probably not going to like at first. Some of the stuff you'll probably get to like, like once you see how to work around the tannins of the wild plums or once the rowan berries get cooked in syrup after you ferment them and then sit in a jar for like three months, they taste way different. Like the wild ingredients don't act like uh, like we expect things mm -hmm. to act like the normal ingredients that are that are easy. I mean, they're by definition wild, but they're they're kind of uncontrollable. We haven't tamed them yet, yeah. and that's good. Yeah, but you know, I want to point out to the listener too that because <clears throat> we went to the restaurant with you, and you must have brought you know four or five tubs of, of things, and many of those tubs are broken up by lots of bags of things. So you you, I, I, you must have brought fifteen twenty species or something, you know? Absolutely, and 
it wasn't just the things that uh, typically we see commercially foraged. It wasn't just like, here's the maitake mushrooms, the ramps and the, you know, fiddleheads or something. It was like ingredients that rarely would make their way into the restaurant. So you're in a kind of a specialty niche. Uh, th- it's a niche that I, that I'm creating, that I'm, I'm chiseling it out right now. And it's part of, you know, when I was running my first restaurant, the salt cellar, I was, ta- I had an agreement with the owners where I would go out for one to two days a week, uh, or every two weeks and just harvest things mm-hmm. and then have my sous, I have my sous chefs run the restaurant because that competitive advantage, that is what the chef wants, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I can kind of think of. I can think from the mind of a forager and the mind of a chef, what, what do the chefs want? They want what no one else can mm-hmm. have. And what do general, generally speaking, what do commercial foragers want? Things that weigh a lot that cost money. Mm-hmm. So we're not paying attention to things that are, that I think are really important. I was in ch- searching for things for my restaurant that were worth a lot of money. I didn't care about the money. I never paid myself. I wanted competitive advantage. I was foraging for flavor not foraging for money. Mm. And that is the big differentiation of really what I kind of bring to the table. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to flesh out what are the tiny, tiny aromatics, tiny flavorful seeds, things that people wouldn't pay attention to, but have big flavor. You know, so on kind of a, the foraging side of things, you know, I, I, I get people that kind of laugh at me sometimes like, why do you pick chickweed? You don't get a lot of calories out of that. Mm. And I say, I don't, I'm not starving. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not starving here. But yeah. chickweed is absolutely delicious. And more specifically, it's one of the few plants that I really enjoy raw. You know, there's not tons of wild greens. I'm going to go out and just munch, munch, munch raw. Uh, I mean, with some exception, like lamb's quarter and a few, a few other things, like some herbs. But something that you can eat in a lot of volume, that's soft, tender, sweet, and it's basically, I call it nature's microgreen, which mm-hmm. is kind of another, it's a huge pet peeve of mine is microgreens. Uh, yeah, I didn't see any tweezers in your uh, knife roll. <laughs> no. Oh, twe- yeah, tweezers are a good story. So I'll tell you what, I, I actually, when we open up the new Heartland, I mean, this is, this is a big, this is a big place. And I was a little intimidated. I went out and bought, I, I thought. Like a lot of young cooks, I had an idea of what I thought this, you know, shining Mount Olympus of, of fine dining was. And I went out and bought myself a pair of white Birkenstocks and <laughs> a brand new, super expensive set of uh, Italian culinary tweezers. And some of the old timers that were like doing the prep in the morning just looked at me like, who is this young, who is this fool? <laughs> and been that guy many I, times. <laughs> and I... I was wrong, you you know, and I still see there's tons of tweezers. Here's what culinary tweezers are good for. Retrieving the last olive out of a jar. (laughs) That is what a culinary (laughs) tweezer is for in my world. See, there's nothing that you can do with culinary tweezers, really, that you cannot do with tongs or even better, with your hands. (laughs) Like, take... Make sure your hands are clean. Toss the salad with your hands. Touch the ingredients. You feel, feel them. You know, when I scatter something on a plate, I also do it twice as fast as you would with the tweezers. And I see a lot of a lot of these young cooks, you know, kind of just obsess over putting the perfect thing. You get the, the puree here and the twiggy thing over here. And then the perfect, you know, quinelle, the egg shape of whatever the garnish is. And it's just like, oh, I just, I can't even look at it. Pastry chefs can be even worse. Um, just with how overwrought I think food can really tend to look. And the more I cook, the less I put on a plate. Okay. And I, and the more I cook, the more I just search for what is the greatest ingredient I can possibly find right now and how little can I do to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the way that you showcase your ingredients. You were talking about not liking to chop things so fine that you lose what they are, keeping their inherent natural shape and texture, you know, and those are things I really appreciate. So there's a very, you have a very refined cuisine, but, um, but it also uh, remains like a whole food dish at the same time. And And it it can look very simple. Like the plates can look like this is food. This looks like food. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, Something I was back to your sort of discussion of, 
searching for flavors. Um, something I was talking to uh, folks last night around the table about, I was saying it reminds me of times where uh, I've heard a band or a musician that has tuned their instruments or their equipment in such a way that you hear a sound that you're like, well, I've never heard this sound. Like, you know, you get a unique sound and then a lot of bit bands will parody that. And then eventually that becomes a normal sound. You get used to it. Uh, but tasting your food was like, wow, these are some flavors that were really unique to me. Like you have some flavors in your palate that I hadn't really ever tasted. And so each time we would taste, especially that first night, Grant, we were trying all those different sauces, sauces yeah. and it was like, what am I tasting? These are things that it's, it's almost like, yeah, like if you could see in a, a color spectrum and there was like a little pie slice of colors you hadn't seen before, and then you see them for the first time, it was like parts of my tongue were being activated with heat and bitters and astringents that were just in this profile that I was like, I like this. This is, it tastes good to me, but I've never tasted it. Yeah. It's like I say, it's kind of like the final frontier. You know, we have, we have like a selection of flavors and scents and aromas and things that have basically been like sold to us, like spice companies, like here's your selection of spices. Look mm -hmm. at our catalog. Mm -hmm. Why should we think that that is everything? Why should we take that at face value that that is everything that we have, uh, to paint our picture with. Yeah. You know, it's, it is, it's way more, but to unlock these things to, to first, we have to find them. Then we have to research them, you know, know exactly what they are, figure out, okay, some of the stuff doesn't taste good. There are some things I do. I don't like, uh, but with the aromatics and things like, um, I had you smell the schnapps that I'm working on made with sweet fern nut lets. Yeah. And that's something the bartenders and, and the distilleries are super, super excited about. I can see but, why. It's, but it's insanely labor intensive to harvest. It's a flavor again. That's another one, sweet fern. I mean, if somebody hasn't smelled or tasted it, it's like there's sort of hints of vanilla, hints of sage or savory herbs. There's, it's just, uh, it's sweet, it, it, but it's not like anything. There's not an analog that I can think of in the normal American palate that I could just point to and say, oh yeah, it's sort of like this. So there you are with this, this schnapps that is, I mean, I imagine for a bartender, it's like, this is new, yeah, something new. Completely new. And to me, what I, what I think of is I look at the, the area around it and it smells like other things in the area taste coming from that sandy, mm -hmm. uh, acidic soil. You know, other things like conifer products and ornamental cedar cones, uh, cedar cones, uh, more estomatic pine cones, yeah, we pine had, needles. We, we had that sauerkraut that you had used where, where normally you would have juniper and caraway or something. You had these cedar cones. Yeah, that there. one's an ongoing experiment. That one, I, I wrote down the method for that because I liked it, but I'm trying to figure out how to use. Cedar cones are widely available. Like widely available. I was picking those from a cemetery. Great place to pick uh, some things because they're nice and manicured. I, I stop it a lot. Yeah, there's also they're old great. oaks a lot of times. Fruit, fruit trees, little ornamental fruit yeah. trees. Oh yeah. They cut down. I'll just little side note, but there was an apple tree that had been grafted to grow several different apples at the cemetery I drive by a lot. So last year I was there picking, and uh, or actually two years ago, and then last year I came to go and they had cut it down, and I I just felt like they cut it down because they saw me foraging it and they didn't <laughs> like it. They're like, this is disrespectful. Just get rid of the tree. If we can't have it, no <laughs> one can. But but anyway, yeah, I agree. Cemetery. So go on. Okay. So cedar uh, cones. But the, the cedar cones. So there's a lot of different things that look like juniper. Yeah. And the the only one that I've tasted, most of them are crazy astringent. Like super, so astringent. Bitter. Just really aggressive. There's the flavor of juniper, but it's hidden beneath these layers that just really beat you over the head of bitter astringency it, the, the tannins uh they're very hard to eat there's the, the juniper the closest thing that i've had is the juniper it's a small shrub uh, i can't remember the exact uh, latin binomial here but then it, that one has no astringency it's got a pure juniper flavor especially really good harvested at the green stage but the needles you will be bloody mm. after you are picking mm -hmm. them Okay, if I go pick cedar cones, it's just all oh, just gentle. soft, gentle, <laughs> gentle cedar leaves. It's like, oh, this is just great. This is so easy. Yeah. Snip, snip, snip with the scissors and just yeah. fill bags in a minute. But they don't, the cedar cones don't act exactly like juniper. They do, but they kind of don't. So what I was doing is I, I really like to, uh, one of the safest ways to ferment things, 
uh, I ferment things and all kinds of things and or you know old school crocks jars uh, but vacuum sealing is a way to get through is a way to con- kind of control and keep flavors inside of something because the air is not escaping and uh, the carrot flowers are another thing that are really interesting uh, used this way but if I trap something in a bag and um, and we should touch on the sous vide in a, in a little bit with that. I don't know if you were, we were going to talk about that. But the, the cedar, kind of like working with the truffle where I'm trying to capture the aroma more than I'm trying to actually mm-hmm. eat the physical thing. Yep. Trapping it in there with zero air, where in any other sort of vessel I'd probably have some air loss, is a really good way to really control, compress, and kind of compact those flavors together. So yeah, the sauerkraut tastes like cedar. And it's a cool flavor. It's kind of like mild juniper for someone yep. that might uh, might not dig on it. But it's really good. It's widely available. Uh, the next thing I need to do is juice it. Oh, uh, that's a, that's a Magnus Nielsen trick I've been I've been looking at. Who's Magnus Magnus Nielsen? Magnus Nielsen people? is um, he's a chef from Favakin in northern Sweden, and he, along with Rene Redzepier, basically the two chefs. Rene is from Noma. Rene's from Noma. Yeah, uh, they're basically the two more modern chefs michelle bross was the first was really he was really the first the first one uh even before them and they t- they take a lot from michelle so michelle doesn't get a lot of Where's credit he? michelle is in leol uh that's in uh Aubrac, southern france okay and his restaurant should be still there but i think his son gave back their michelin stars um <laughs> but yeah, Michel bross is incredible like i said he's got he had this one his signature dish is called the gargouillou um and it's basically a dish of like 40 to 80 different singular things put on a plate in succession. Uh, it could be purees, bitter herbs, a slice of something raw, a slice of something cooked, a slice of something that cooked in a different way to have three different types of it. But it's just this giant salad of single ingredients. It's, it's incredible. Um, and it's been copied, you know, innumerable uh, amounts of times in, in the years after he started to do that. But he was really the first. But Magnus has a restaurant, I think, that he's closing in called Favakin. And his book is really, really great if you like working with wild food. Of course, it's super high restaurant level mm-hmm. technique. But just the What's ideas. The called? It's called uh, Favakin. Okay. And he's also got another really good book that's almost even better for home cooks. Uh, that is all about Scandinavian cooking, and that's through Fidon, and that is a tome. That's like a thousand, a thousand pages. It's huge. Called what? Uh, I forget. I forget the name. It's, it's a big Magnus Scandinavian Nielsen. cookbook by Man- Magnus Nielsen, but it's okay. like traditional Scandinavian stuff. So they were so limited in their what we would consider traditional restaurant ingredients, right? That, that there's been a lot of experimentation off their landscape. Yes, it's you know super hyper seasonal like he's got his carrots are buried in dirt in a root cellar uh and then because the carrots are buried in dirt the little tops are kind of sticking out and vegetables are still alive mm-hmm. in the dark they will grow sprouts but because they're in the dark that's called blanching uh either by keeping something in the dark or by tying something together or by putting a board on something in the abscess of light plants can't photosynthesize they will make white sprouts mm-hmm. instead of green it's like when you see uh, an asparagus that's that's albino, exactly right? that's what mm-hmm. that it is a blanched vegetable cardoons are a blanched vegetable so yeah i've been watching this technique this week or, or seeing you pull out these vacuum seal bags and you get a little giddy as you'd open them talking about sort of like this ferments going on inside for me fermentation is something i've always done in mason jars or in my like german crocs um, and i'd never seen this technique i use same kind of vacuum sealer and vacuum bags for packing meat and fish. Um, can you sort of, you know, without giving away your secrets of it, what, what is sort of the overview of how you could use vacuum bags to, to do fermentations at home? Well, it allows you to do a couple different things. And I mean, I like to ferment in my big, I got like 20 pounds of sauerkraut going in my red wing ceramic crock right mm-hmm. now on the porch. I mean, I do it all the different ways. It depends on what I want to do. Uh, and kind of like with with sous vide cooking too, I do not use it for everything at all. But it's just another tool in the kit. If it can give me 
something that I couldn't get from a natural method. So I, I think probably my favorite is I'll take something, whatever it is. It could be a mushroom. It could be shredded cabbage. It could be ramp leaves. And then depending on kind of the ambient heat, if it's in summer, I'm going to use 5% of that product's weight in salt. If it's in the winter, I can get a low with a I can get away with a little bit lower amount of salt and I'll use 3% of its weight in salt. And that's kind of just it's like a general formula, but if you put it in the vacuum bag, it allows you to ferment the stuff in a much smaller amount of a liquid. Like well with cabbage, you're it has a lot of water. Uh, but something like ramp leaves, if you put ramp leaves with 3% of their weight in salt and weigh them down, that's going to be really, it's going to be difficult. Uh, they won't release enough moisture the way cabbage does to be underwater. Yeah, yeah. You might have to adjust it with a little bit of brine. Uh, another good one is Brussel sprout kraut, which is ridiculously good. So you can get away with uh, without brining things, which gives you a stronger flavor yeah. because they're just sitting in their own juices. Uh, so like that sauce I, that I showed you, that was just ramp leaves in their own juice. And then, like I say, fermented to the next dimension. <laughs> so you put, you're taking the salt and you, the leaves and you're just putting them into that plastic bag and sealing them. Or is there anything else that's happening? And that's it. And really? then time. And then there's other. And they're out at room temperature. They're in. A, oh, absolutely. At room temperature. Just sitting in there like that. Just sitting in and there. You don't have like botulism risks or anything like there's that. There's no air. Yeah. That's a good point. But what I thought it was like anaerobic. Anyway, I, yeah, I was surprised to see that. So, um, but the flavors were amazing. And you, especially what you kept talking about was that this captures aromas. That yeah, that, that's, the, that's the bigger off. thing. Um, and I was, I misspoke saying there's no air in the botulism. You're, you're correct on that. But it's a, a, more so it's a way to, to capture aromas. Um, like with sous vide, I said for years, I will never, ever, ever use it. And I made fun of all of my friends that would use it. And then I had to do a dinner where I had one lamb, and it was a small lamb, and I had to serve 30 entree-sized pieces of something to people who were paying very good money for it. And the only thing I could do, the only thing I could think of, was to debone the entire lamb, keeping it whole, taking the spine out, deboning the entire, wow. taking every single bone out of the lamb, then taking some of the large muscles and uh, f kind of filleting and butterflying them out. And then I took the lamb and fabricated a perfect rectangle out of everything that was uh, perfectly flat, like a rectangle in every dimension. And then I season it, uh, you know, a bunch of rotted oregano, ramp leaves, and then I roll it up like a jelly roll. And The whole lamb? The entire lamb, lamb ketta. Wow. Like the, so the entire thing is fabricated so that it is flat and a rectangle wow. just with a single boning knife. And then I roll the thing up like a jelly roll. Which is how big? Uh, well, I actually had to cut it in half because it was going to be too thick to go on the plate for the round that I wanted, or it would have to be a really thin slice. So yeah. I cut it, then I cut it in half from there and made two rolls. And then I cut each of those rolls into thirds. And then I tried cooking one, just the braise, searing it and braising it slow in the oven. And it kind of fell apart after it cooked. And then I was in this, uh, I was not pleased, but the kitchen I was renting, this guy was just all about the toys and things like that. He's like, I got a bronze pasta extruder and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> he said, Alan, let me show you the sous vide. And I said, I, you know what? I got to make this happen. Let's do it. <laughs> in a moment of desperation. <laughs> and in a moment of desperation, the, the takeaway is that it allowed me to do something that I was not going to be able to do without yeah. it. And that is kind of the differentiation that I think is important with using tools, with using any tool. It should have a purpose. And there, there's a, a purpose, should be a purpose for every tool. You know, it should, I, I like using it if it can allow me to do something that I can't do otherwise. Um, it reminds me, because we hear, and we'll get into the pigeons in a bit, but we've been here hunting pigeons, and I brought a 22 uh, rimfire firearm, and I brought a 177 caliber air gun to shoot with, you know, pellets. And we were, Grant and I were talking about it a lot this week. And I felt like it's, it wasn't about like, which one is better for this job. It's like, which job am I doing? And exactly. when we were indoor in the barn, the right tool is the, the pellet gun. When we were outside shooting far, uh, the right tool was the 22 and they were both invaluable. And I think, um, if I understood what you were saying about sous vide this week, it was like, sometimes people just want to try to use it for everything or they become reliant Ugh. on it. And then it, it they, it covers up weaknesses in their culinary yes. game. Yeah. 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 
So like young, you know, young cooks, they, what do they see? They see the greatest restaurants, you know, they're looking at this Mount Olympus view of things and all the really nice restaurants are going to be like sous vide their meat before it goes on the grill, uh, before it gets cooked. And they think it's like everything has to be done like that. And it's like, you know, we were making very good food before that. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it for everything. Don't use it for everything. For some, for a few things, it, it can work very nice. Uh, What's the weakness that it would create in, in your cooking? What if you're at a place and you want to cook and you want to impress someone and you, you don't have your sous vide kit? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You maybe try to shoot off the hip and let's say you're going to cook a short rib or something or cook a rib with the meat on the bone and you you don't know how to braise things right you cook the thing to the beyond and the meat's just falling apart and it's mush because that's what most people do with braised meat is they cook it till it's absolute mush like ribs should not fall off the bone you can make a fool out of yourself depending on the situation of course but it, it kind of pigeonholes people into using it for everything, you need to learn the basic the skills first. Mm -hmm. Learn how to cook over fire before you learn how to boil something in a bag. Mm -hmm. And people will sous vide things like pigeons. Mm -hmm. And then they will grill it. I'm doing air quotes right now. They'll grill the pigeon <laughs> when it comes out of the sous vide. And that grill is like, we're talking like 10 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. That's not grilled. That's like you waved it over a grill and put it on a plate. <laughs> like, give me a break. That's not grilling food. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. When you're at a restaurant, um, how sensitive are you to technique? Uh, I mean, hypersensitive. So like I was saying, I usually will eat at, I would probably prefer to eat at a hole in the wall, like some little, a little Latin American joint, get some pupusas and a little curtido. I would rather eat something like that than something kind of in the mid range. I'm either going to eat at a really low brow hole in the wall, mom and pop joint, or I'm going to eat at whatever the best restaurant you have in the area is. That's, I really don't kind of do the in between because I'm setting myself up for failure. Yeah. I set myself up to be disappointed. Right? Yeah. Love the tamales you sent us for, by the way, <laughs> best I've ever had. Um, yeah. Okay. So this thing of sous vide, um, basically covering up and masking people's, knowledge of cooking protein is what you're talking about yeah and it for fish it is not good for fish either it makes it mushy mm -hmm. it, it can give it can give when things are cooked for a really long time it can give it a mushy like a soft mushy taste i'm guess i'm curious because there's something i've noticed about you um during this week is you have a real appreciation for the science of what's happening in the cooking process, but you're not stuffy about it. Like you have all the art and sort of spirit there too. Um, but I would think of sous vide as like a scientific cooking method, or there's a lot of the sort of like uh, molecular gastronomy stuff that I think Ugh. if you said scientific cooking, people would think of that, but you're, you're into scientific cooking, but it's different. Um, I don't know if, if I'm setting you up right to, to talk about what I'm saying here, but like, you you talk a lot about while you're cooking, you're talking about what's happening scientifically in the pan or sort of in the fermentation process. So it's not like you're anti-science. It's more about some of these tools and techniques that have, that are enjoying a popular, uh, some level of popularity right now that I think you see maybe as a little gimmicky. Hey, we'll get right back to the show, but I wanted to take a moment to tell you how you can see season one of Wild Fed. If you head over to wild-fed.com right now, you'll see that pre-orders for Season 1 are available alongside the Season 1 experience. Both will begin on January 6th of 2020. If you choose the show on its own, you'll get access to a new episode every week for 8 weeks. Remember, these are 30-minute episodes, not the 22 minutes of a typical TV show. If you choose the program, it'll include season one, but each week, along with a new episode, you'll receive a director's cut, where our producer Grant Giuliano and I break down the episode, discussing the background, the gear we use, the places and people and stories involved, as well as some of the comedy that took place on the side, some of the drama, some of the intrigue that we couldn't squeeze into the 30-minute format. You'll also get exclusive access to a weekly live Q&A where we'll be answering your questions and discussing how you can get started hunting, fishing, and foraging for food. 
Additionally, this will all take place inside of a private member group where you'll have access to me and the WildFed team for a full nine weeks, as well as a community of like-minded folks. If you just want to see the show on its own, it's 49 bucks. If you want to join me in the nine week program, that's just 249 bucks. Go over to wild-fed.com to get the show or sign up for the program. Now, here's the rest of the podcast. Yeah, so th- I think the big differentiation here is that the gimmicky stuff, and I think molecular gastronomy is a complete gimmick. Uh, I'm not interested in going to a restaurant and eating balloons that you made that taste like a green apple. <laughs> that, 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 hold, that holds ze- absolutely zero interest for me. Um, but whether you like it or not, when we're cooking, the science is always going to be there, yeah. whether you like it or not. When you put that steak in a pan and it starts to caramelize, and it's caramelizing faster because I put a little bit of dry brine on it, which is just seasoning meat beforehand and letting it sit out uncovered to kind of form what we call a pellicle, it's going to brown a little bit faster than if I put it in there wet, uh, which could almost make it the, the poêle or a stew is kind of the term. So whether you appreciate the science or not, it's always going to be there mm-hmm. contributing to your final product. So I research the science of things and casually too. Uh, you know, I'm not a crazy stickler about trying to understand every single part of what's going on. But the more you understand about it, the more it will work for you. You know, I try to make the science work for me. Um, but yeah, the, the gimmicky stuff, what I see as gimmicky, food should look like food. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not eating apple balloons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of what I saw on Netflix where there was a joke about, I was an Ali Wong had a, did a movie and, um, that's on Netflix and they're at a dinner. I think it's this and they get served this like clear little shot of something. And they, the, the waiter says the taste of asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a like... break. How about some really, really good asparagus from a local place <laughs> that you have just cooked perfectly? How about, how about that? You, uh, on the science level too, you, you seem to have a pretty good grasp of, um, of like the Linnaean binomial classification system, the, the, um, taxonomy of the plants and mushrooms that you work with, uh, you're differentiating between species in a lot, in a way that a lot of foragers, you know, when you have a group, let's say, or a family group of, of plants, um, sometimes people just sort of think of them all as the same, but you're really making distinctions. And as you seek out flavor, um, and one of the things that you kept bringing up, I'd say almost this is one of this like signature Allen things that we're, I'm leaving with is the way that you would figure out a flavor you liked. And then you would look through the family of plants or related species. And then you'd be like, Oh, the flavors here, the flavors here, the flavors here. This is the flavor of that family, not just that individual plant. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, this is what I call the, uh, I call these the plant family analogs, mm-hmm. um, which is just a term that I've coined because we don't, like with a lot of other things in the world of wild food, we don't have a way to describe yep. it. Mm-hmm. That, you know, we we literally don't have words in the English language to describe specifically what we're talking about here. So the kind of my, my favorite one is sunflower and uh, the Asteraceae family. So Asteraceae is a huge family, like sunflowers, uh, artichokes, cardoons, Lots of little plants like gallon soga, daisies. Uh, they kind of have the, the composite flower. Uh, it used to be called family compositae. Uh, there's a, a flavor in there. The first time I tasted it was when I was tasting uh, cold pressed virgin sunflower oil from a place called Smoothies in Piers, Minnesota. And if you have never tasted, if you want to taste this flavor, This is one of the best things to do is buy some of their oil directly from them. Not on Amazon, not in a store. Uh, Try to get some directly from them. And the flavor is like, it was incredible. And we would season a lot of things uh, with this at Heartland. We called it, I call it the olive oil of the Midwest. But if you put it on a salad, it has an intense flavor like olive oil will, but the flavor is different. It is this kind of strange, funky, celery-esque Although celery is a uh, APAC, it's so it's kind of celery esque. And then I taste a sunflower seed, and it doesn't taste like that. Um, but kind of mo- moving on to connect the things, I was making some some little roulades. I call them the roulade vert. These little green rolls out of a plant called Gallon Soga Parva Flora, and it's a really common, super aggressive garden plant. And I blanch the Gallon Soga, wrap it up in the leaves, and steam it for a little bit. 
And when people were eating these rolls at an event, they kept on saying, what are these artichoke rolls? Like, what, what are these? Are there artichokes in here? I'm like, what are you talking about? It's gallon soga. It kind of tastes like nothing. And I kind of put that away for a little bit. Uh, another thing that I do is like I will cook young sunflowers like an artichoke. Because when I when I I looked in the garden one day I saw green meristematic sunflower heads, and I was like, this looks like an artichoke that's young and tender. Can I eat that? So I cut one and I cooked it, and it had a much stronger flavor than an artichoke. But after I peeled everything off and paired it, kind of like an artichoke, it looked exactly the same. And I, I started kind of putting the pieces together. Um, if you, like we were tasting the gallon soga leaves yesterday, yep. and they taste like Jerusalem Mar- Drew artichoke. Yep, which yeah, is so a sunflower, right? Jerusalem artichoke is in Asteraceae. Is this is all is all related? And this flavor, this weird sunflowery, artichokey, uh, some are stronger than others with with the flavor. But this that flavor that we think of, like artichoke flavor, is a good example. But also sunflower flavor. But a lot of people don't know what that is. So artichoke is kind of a better example. Kind of this artichokey flavor is found in more plants than artichokes. Mm-hmm. That's why cardoons are an artichoke can be an artichoke substitute. Uh, what are cardoons? It, so a cardoon is this incredible thistle-looking plant. There's some in the gardens, actually. We, uh, you could see some when, uh, if you come down later. Uh, they, it looks like celery with glochids, if you know what glochids are. So glochids are the tiny spines on a cactus. Mm-hmm. And I used to torture interns if they would make me angry by having them peel cardoons. Because <laughs> you'll, 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 peel, you'll be peeling them and... Then you go home and there'll be like blood all over your sheets because it waits like six hours until oh, they wow. st- oh yeah it's bad it's like handling a cactus like a, uh, like a choya bud or oh, something yeah. and you get all the time not Little the big hairs. needles yeah. the tiny needles the bad yeah. ones they're frustrating but they're also delicious so you peel them with a towel and it's like a giant it's like a giant celery like three feet long and it's pure white because it's blanched and then you got to peel it and braise it for a little while and it tastes like celery that tastes like artichokes oh wow so yeah so this this artichoke flavor the the key takeaway here is it something that tastes like artichokes doesn't have to be an artichoke um and this whole kind of sunflowery artichoke flavor is not necessarily you know relegated to one specific plant it's a flavorful compound that's in a whole bunch of different plants that is slightly eerily similar or slightly different or very, very similar, depending on what it is, uh, but all with these plants in the same family. And there's some some outliers like stuff in the Brogenaceae will taste a little bit like cucumber. So you have some kind of outliers like that. Remember, like botany is a science, not an exact science. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always have a couple like couple outliers that don't make sense. Uh, but those those are an interesting one too, like borage tastes like cucumber yeah comfrey buds that you tasted <clears> yesterday <throat> taste a bit like cucumber uh but they're not in the cucumber family because right. that's a squash family so there's some kind of outliers like that and there's more examples too but kind of the sunflower and the artichoke comparison is one of, that's one of my favorites and when i sit and explain it to people it, it clicks and it makes sense and it's like of course like why why should a flavor be only in one thing nature is constantly creating evolving and this is the flavorful compound that is from some common ancestor i mean i'm speculating here but it would yeah. be a natural a logical progression i mean it's interesting because there's not really like a taxonomy of flavor that's been done before this is like you know uncharted what? territory. something that i should do yeah exactly. please do please do because you were talking something similar too with the stone fruits the prunus the genus prunus and um you know, you were talking a lot about marzipan and that almondy flavor. Yes. And that's another similar one, right? That we can get out of the black cherries and we can get it out of the choke cherries and we can get it out of almonds. And if we crack open an apricot or peach kernel, it's like it's in there. It's like this flavor that pervades all of these different plants as well. Yeah. And that's that's one uh, that almond flavor is something that people have known about for a long time, uh, especially in the Middle East where they use something called malab, uh, which is a specific type of cherry where they take the stone inside and and grind it up and then with uh, native americans and this will be in my book um 
something they use called the Wopila, um, which should be, it should be a Lakota flour they would make from like sun dried or fermented and dried uh, wild cherries, choke cherries mm. specifically. And the, the flavors that you get out of it, it's ridiculous. It's one of the, the one of the coolest things I've tasted all year. When I make my uh, choke cherry syrup, I always take some of the cherries and blend them real f- hard in my Vitamix to crack some of the kernels. So I can cook some of that flavor into it. Because to me, the when I eat choke cherries, I tend to crunch a lot of them down and eat the seeds too. And that, so to me, the flavor of cherry is now associated also with that flavor and the fruit itself. So I like the two. Totally, totally. Two together. And then, then from there, you know, like for me, like... If I'm bringing that to bring that to chef, like I did this week, um, I will say, Hey, here's something you can think about when you're putting together a dish or, uh, specifically I'm, I was uh, talking to the pastry chef here said, when you're thinking about cooking with these things, now think about other things in the Rose family that you can put together. Maybe it's apples that are cooked in some way they're made into a a custard and it's steamed and then there's a little bit of choke cherry syrup that goes on how can we pair different things from the rose family together now specifically because they're in the family Mm -hmm. to to celebrate these flavorful connections uh obviously apples don't taste like marzipan but their seeds do yeah uh you know so how can we I, i like to be playful with how i do the pairings uh, kind of as food, but also now as an educational tool yeah. as well. And, you know, then uh, consulting and talking to the service staff about how to kind of flesh that out in a quick, succinct way so diners and guests can understand that it really elevates uh, a guest's experience at the restaurant because then they come away saying, that was really good and I learned something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're really onto something with that. That whole taxonomic approach to flavor is... Uh, I just feel like it's it's a new direction, and it brings the botany together with yeah. The no, they love culinary. each they, yeah. they love each other. It's it's a good marriage, and there's more. I just have to uncover them, which is uh, that's where Sam is a huge Sam Thayer, my my friend, is a huge huge help to me. Yeah, I was gonna say um, your your friendship with Sam Thayer, who for those listening, I'm sure you know he's quite well known if you're into the foraging world, but he is sort of the I'd say the leading voice in foraging right now in North America, as far as, you know, putting out, I would say beyond, yeah, putting out books that, you know, what had happened for so long was just these, these books of either people who weren't actually foragers and maybe were doing plant ID books masquerading as foraging books. That was common or a lot of books that repeated stories that were repeated and repeated and repeated throughout books. Yeah. So that you ended up with things that just weren't true things that you were told you could eat that when you would try were terrible techniques you were told would make things edible that didn't or things that you were told you couldn't eat that you actually can and are fantastic milkweed comes to mind that is the best in my mind that's the best example and it's sam just has a way of dispelling these myths through incredible amounts of research Mm -hmm. there's there's no way around it it is a lot of hard work and he does his homework forward and backward on everything it's just it's intense and that's why I love his book so much because he's not trying to do the shotgun approach. Mm-hmm. He's not trying to have one book where he's covering, you know, 90 species of things and most of them have one okay picture. He's writing like basically whole chapters on a specific, you know, single edible plant. Mm-hmm. And you just, you can go so much deeper that way. And yeah, the myth dispelling. And also just flaying out all these different ingredients, the obscure stuff is really just where it is where he shines. Because mm-hmm. um, like he'll say to me, like, Alan, I love telling you about uh, the water pepper or the beach peas that we were looking at the other day. And he says, I, I show these to the other people that hunt food and they, they may say, ah, oh, that's okay. I'm not going to get too many calories out of it, though. But I mean, for me, it's like each one of these things that we'll talk about or if we're emailing back and forth is, is just an, it's like golden nuggets, Mm -hmm. you know, this, we are on a giant Easter egg hunt and each one of these things, maybe there's some sort of historical process he's been looking at, or he's been researching Native American uses, which we have, you know, scarce to little to no documentation of that 
is the real hunt and that is what is really really exciting is to you know unearth and find these things that have been lost or on the verge of mm-hmm. of being lost and to you know bring bring them back in and add them to our our culinary world i'm i'm guilty of that thing you just mentioned which is that i'm really calorie focused so it's like you know i hunt and i fish for just all of our meats and i render all kinds of fat and i gather you know when vegetables that can I can really eat and mass are available, that's what I'm gathering. So milkweed, leeks, fiddleheads, things like that, or wild rice. So I get really focused on that, and I love to cook. Um, but again, on where I'm weak, and I, and this is what I got really excited about seeing you doing is just stepping back from that and going like, yeah, but what about all these flavors? And you are sort of bringing me to all these different plants that are, you know, Maine has a similar flora. To to- totally, totally. And there's a lot of things that I just have overlooked because like you said, in my attitude was like, well, it's just not really a lot of substantial food there. But then here I am cooking with, you know, herbs and spices that I could replace with local analogs. And that's yeah. the kind of thing that I get excited about. So anyway, I'm just glad there's someone like you doing that. And, uh, or, or like maybe part of it too, you got somebody like Sam doing what he's doing and then you taking this practical application of some of that stuff where it's like, you know, Sam's not a chef, right? So he's doing his piece and then you're able to take that, some of that work and go like, well, let's see how we actually use this. Yeah. We things. have a totally like it, it cross pollinates yeah. very, very, yeah. very well. Um, another thing that you do, uh, and I thought this was also unique. I hadn't really seen anyone talking about this, uh, in my travels is you, you were getting, well, let's first, I wanted to find the term meristematic or meristem, which refers to tender young growth essentially. Right. And um, you have this interest in the meristematic seeds of plants. So things that we would consider to be culinary herbs uh, or seeds that are usually dried, fully matured and dried. And it, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seemed like you were really interested in using them before they reached that stage when they were still tender and edible and didn't have to be mortar and pestle ground into a powder first to sprinkle on things, but you could actually use sort of like a vegetable. Yeah, and it's it's more like a like a... It's a, a seasoning, depending on what it is, but just because we see seeds in a store and they're dried, why do we see seeds in a store that are dried in the spice section? It's because they have a good shelf life. Uh, but when, when I'm, I'm walking around looking at things, looking for, for the next new fun thing to eat, I, you're seeing things in stages as they grow. And there's a green seed stage um, there's a green pine cone stage, like right. a middle stage. There's all sorts of different stages of growth. And if something's edible, you can probably eat it during most of these stages and it'll give you different things and do different things for you. Uh, so the cryptotania seeds we were harvesting are kind of like seasoning something with concentrated parsley. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, one thing I like to do is I like to turn the wild food lens onto garden plants and like green coriander. And th- this is also a chef thing from the chef community is working with green seeds. Uh, again, we should, and we'll probably need to give credit to Michelle Brass and uh, Renee and Magnus for working with a lot of these things. Uh, like Magnus will take green juniper and put that through a juicer and drizzle that okay. over something like fresh scallops, mm-hmm. uh, if I remember correctly. But yeah, working with green stages, green seed stages, meristematic seeds. It can give you a lot of different things. Uh, the brined green caraway seeds are a favorite of mine, especially like smoked fish or mixed into meat for tartare. But yeah, you can do a lot of different things with uh, green meristematic seeds. Uh, making capers, those are with flower pods te- most of the time. Um, yeah, I was like, hey, do you like to eat the daylilies? And you were like, well, I like the pods. <laughs> yeah, I like the pods. Yeah. I, I, like the, I do like the shoots too. I made the mistake of eating some raw. Uh, don't eat daylily shoots raw. That was a long time ago. They're they're great though. Just, just cook effect. them. Uh, no, like really intense nausea with oh. no vomiting or like evacuation. Just really intense for a while. You and, cracked and me up fades. the other day. You said uh, you said you'd been described as the Indiana Jones of. For, <laughs> how did you say that? Yeah, one of my one of my friends. Uh, th- 
described me. He's like, yeah, you're like the Indiana Jones of the wild food. And like, yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, could possibly be a little bit dangerous. And I usually come back with dinner. <laughs> I like the, there's that like element of danger and foraging where. And I mean, there is. You, you know? try things, and sometimes it goes wrong. And luckily, most of us are alive to tell yeah, about the, it. I mean, but... the the tame the tame danger is in you know does a dish not work but there i mean there's real danger too i mean you when i'm picking blueberries i'm up there in the pine barrens in uh the county that has i think what sam said is the highest bear density in north america mm-hmm. uh lyme disease which you guys are very familiar with where, where you're from which you which you've which i had dealt with huh you have uh, quite a story there yeah i mean i i got lyme at I got the paralysis. I was in the restaurant. I had to cook with an eye patch on uh, because my eye sunk back in my head only on one side of my face and made it so I couldn't really see well. And it looked like a zombie eye. And then my yeah, I had to wear earplugs because the, uh, the sound, like if someone clinked a saute pan together, just like tink. It was like a gunshot went off wow. next to my ear. Like everything was super, super tender and, uh, really just hurt on my on my left side and i couldn't speak um so then my my chef at the time said it would either call me um the pirate or a chef mushmouth <laughs> <laughs> kitchen love for you yeah but there are some like yeah you know i think that element of danger for me is like welcome but uh at the same time, I always have to like be careful. Like the other day, I almost climbed that silo to get that pigeon off the top, and it was just like We're in the barn. Yeah, there's a couple things that maybe were a little, a yeah, little, dang- little on the dangerous. Up, yeah, in the pursuit of game, um, you know. But that danger sort of makes it a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me what you mean when you say uh, real plants doing real plant things. Well, so this is a good time to talk about like microgreens. So people love to put, chefs love to put microgreens. You know what microgreens are? Yeah, I see them in the store there. Oh my God. So what happens here? And I mean, no offense if any of you out there grow microgreens or sell them. Some of my friends do, and some of them taste good. Sunflowers are probably my favorite. But what are microgreens? Microgreens are grown, they're plants that are grown in a tray. And... That kind of differs from plants that grow outside. You know, when plants are growing outside, there's wind, there's conditions. Some of them are probably going to die. It's like the Oregon Trail. You know, only the <laughs> only the strong plants survive. You know, I'll talk specifically like about chickweed and lamb's quarter here because those are ones that I use a lot uh, in place of microgreens. But these microgreens clipped in a tray, they're weak. They're they're very very young, and they they wilt quickly. Uh, if you put a pile of them, chefs love to put them. Like okay, say so you got a you got a seared piece of salmon with some beautiful crispy skin and a, a little bit of mustard sauce and some roasted potatoes, and then you're gonna put a garnish on the top. What's a garnish? A big handful of microgreens. What's gonna happen after it sits in the pass for a little bit? You know they're probably gonna put it into a heat window. And then those microgreens, those fresh, tender, delicate greens, they're going to start wilting immediately as the salmon steams it upwards. Mm -hmm. So it looks good when it's in the pass. It looks okay as chef hands it off. But if that sits just for a second, and even so, when it goes in front of the diner, the diner's sitting there eating it. This is probably about a good five, six minutes after it's been plated. Those microgreens are a pile of pubes on top of your salmon. (laughs) And it is just a wilted rat's nest of wilted plant matter and it's stringy and it tastes like nothing and they just they can't hold up it's not their fault we're just not chefs just aren't using them correctly they should be used on cold dishes only uh if you if you want to use them unless they can really stand up like sunflower sprouts but things like chickweed lamb's quarters those can be excellent substitutes because i can put those i will put those on a hot dish all day and they will stand up, and it'll be like a, a nice little salad with your dish, and it's a great garnish. They're not going to die because they were. They're not going to die from wilting from the heat on that plate because they were outside, being real plants, doing real plant things, mm-hmm. as I like to say. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I want to put that on a T-shirt. Yeah. Man. I really like or it. Or bandana. Um, 
I want to just kind of uh, conclude by talking a little bit about the dinner we had last night. And in particular, I want to talk about pigeons because um, when we decided to come out here, it was between hunting seasons and we were mm-hmm. like, oh, what are we going to do for a protein out there? Kind of like, oh, pigeons. And we had kind of said, well, there's a morning dove season opening in September. And you were like, oh, August is better. What do you think about pigeons? And and I mean, I just had never thought about rock doves, pigeons before. And uh, anyway, I am so glad that yeah. you suggested it because my mind is forever changed about this bird. I mean, this bird's yeah. like going on my totem pole now. It kind of started I mean? off as like, okay, I guess that'll work. Yeah, that'll work. And then it was like, we started learning more about pigeons and started getting really excited. Yeah. Got out here and saw, okay, these aren't like dusty, dirty street pigeons. These are farm pigeons. These are clean, healthy, fat birds living on corn. They're delicious they're they're beautiful to look at i mean just i've they're beautiful. Fall, yeah, i've they're fallen beautiful. in love with them oh they're yes. beautiful yes they remind me i was i don't know if either of you guys will remember this but when i was a kid oakley used to make these windbreaker jackets and if you're standing one way they'd look purple and then you'd kind of move and you'd be like oh it's green and then they'd move again and it'd be blue it had like this shimmering uh opalescent changes right i used to make fun of my friend who would wear these things <laughs> anyway um these birds are like that as you're turning them it's it's purple it's green it's around his neck you know so gorgeous all the grays and the whites anyway i've just i'm smitten by this bird now uh but it wasn't until yesterday uh we when <laughs> the back story is there's a few that i shot that uh you know because we we probably harvested about 15 but we probably actually killed about 20 some got taken by crows some got lost one we found you found yesterday in the barn i was looking around for you know some some stragglers maybe hiding in a nest that we could take because we wanted to get a shot of uh corn in the crop because that was you know what we did what we kind of based that wild mushroom and pigeon soup on with the sweet corn yeah like what are they eating let's let's put some of that in the dish anyway you found one that had been sh- shot with the pellet gun but had survived it for a while and had eventually fallen from the eaves and uh we didn't know how long it had been sitting there, but it smelled good. And I thought, well, this is how European age a bird. And I've eaten turkeys that sat on a slab for a week, you know, and the meat was just really tender. So we opened that one up and uh, took the breasts out. And wow, that was the first one I had. Just amazing. And it was really, the, uh, that was one of the best that, I don't know, what, three-day-old pigeon from the floor of a barn is probably one of the best pigeons I have had. <laughs> yeah, And I was really... I was I was a little skeptical. I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm gonna chew and spit, treat it like a bull eat. And it was really, really good. God, it was good. Um, the thing that occurs to me about pigeon is it's not like um for instance when you were talking about wild plums earlier and you were saying, you know, hey, there's this astringency in the skin. Uh you gotta learn to work with that. Uh, you gotta learn to work around that or you know, we had the black walnut that you had uh, candied where it's like you're having to overcome all of these flavors. Anyway, with the pigeon, it's not like there's something you need to overcome. It's just a good tasting bird. Yeah. It's just something where you need to apply some heat and salt and just taste it. <laughs> so just, let, just let it do just let it do its thing. You want to walk us through last night's menu a little bit? Yeah. So, and I agonized over this for for a long time let's see we had started off with a little bit of soup so a lot of people you know even if they do shoot pigeons mo- what do most people do they shoot pigeons and they just you know crack a miller light and shoot some more and then <laughs> they go home and they eat a steak out of the fridge <laughs> if, if so yes, true yes it's so true and if they do shoot the pigeons for meat they usually just breast them out uh you know plucking a bird one of the most expensive birds that I have ever purchased are plucked pigeons. And I used to serve a single pigeon breast on a plate with a two ounce piece of pork belly. A single belly. breast is both halves, two pecs. A single breast. An individual, an one, individual one breast. <laughs> yeah, one breast <laughs> yep. with a two ounce piece of pork belly for about 33 to $35. My God, that's crazy to hear that. And the whole plucked pigeons, there's only really one place that sells them. You're going to run around $16, $17 a piece for a plucked pigeon. Unbelievable. And they're really good. But we took the we took the carcasses that you so really, really nicely plucked to work on all that, Daniel. Thank you. Um, we took those and chopped them up. You also have to chop up the carcasses, chop them up with the shears, and then we brown them up, make a good stock. Well, we add a couple sweet corn cobs, 
and then strain that off. And then we added some diced lobster mushrooms and a little bit of smoked lamb fat and then some sliced Romaria botrytis. Which, by the way, when you found those, so the Romaria is the um, coral mushroom, correct? Yes. And the you, ter- terrestrial Terrestrial coral. coral. Uh, which is one of those ones that you hear all the time that you can eat or can't eat or it's questionable, blah, blah, blah. And you uh, had been talking about this mushroom. Anyway, when you came upon that pink coral, wow, did you shout. I mean, you just got excited, man. That was I had really on cool. film, I believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was fantastic. Well, no, I've, only, I've only seen it there one other time. Yeah. And, I, I know, you know, it's like with other things, but with mushrooms, once you, once you pick them, pick them, identify them. And don't eat them. Learn learn about them, and you know you don't have to. Just because you found it doesn't mean you have to eat it. But the more I've researched them, you know, I know I know this mushroom. I know it like an old friend. I have instinctual knowledge uh, that I know a hundred percent what it is when I see it, and I know it is delicious. I know, but I got a really good article that David Aurora uh, allowed me to share, and I'm going to share a couple more of his. Uh, but it's all about if you just Google. Uh, eating Romaria mushrooms, forager chef, you'll see it. It's online there. But in Latin America, large amounts of Romaria are consumed and sold in markets, and they pick them relatively indiscriminately. Um, The ones that I know David Aurora specifically says is you shouldn't pick any that have like a jellied base. Uh, But a lot of people... Base, like where they interface with the ground? Yeah, where it's kind of jellied in there. And I see those very rarely... And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, go pick every Romaria that you see, but I think it's kind of like with Gyromitra where they're getting, they're getting kind of demonized a bit. And I, th- I think it's unfair because many of them are very delicious. And I ate two yellow species while we were making that soup the other day. Those are two different species. I ate both of them yesterday. Mm-hmm. And that was totally fine. Oh, that's what you cooked that's off what, that was, side that was pan. What I, was I was like, he's got a little pan. experiment going no, over totally, there on the side. Totally. It smelled really good. Too. But, yeah, no. uh, but yeah, and, and 10 of us ate the, the Romaria Botrytis. That's the pink one. Uh-huh. Uh, last night. and Only uh, one of us didn't wake up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but seriously, the, uh, the, not just the, you know, the, the beauty of the mushroom itself, but the texture, all of those little tendrils, the way that it... The firmness of it, the way that it held onto the soup when you pick the piece out, I just they're fantastic. So I'll be adding that. But uh, sorry, I'm interrupting here. So there's the soup, and um, you, I like you know lobster mushrooms are one that I've always picked um, as sort of opportunistically, but I'd never really gone out hunting specifically to gather a bunch. And uh, you know we did that with you, and that is a fascinating mushroom. The, the so density, the weight of them, um, how much they hold up they're so robust and uh you know the way that we trimmed them and everything um by the time we were done i just was like how is this thing still like a baseball you know it does not like wilt away or get all soft and mushy in your hand it doesn't brown when you cut it or anything like just what a tough mushroom yeah they're they're really great so the only they with mushrooms Sometimes the flavor is really, really good, but, oh, you got to worry about bugs and it's got a really short shelf life. The the give and take with lobster mushrooms is that their flavor is not super duper incredible just by itself. So I have a couple different tricks for working around it, but they have a bunch of other properties that make them just an incredible edible. So you can harvest them in large amounts. Uh, they have that coating on them that acts like paprika and it acts like paprika very strongly oh, like you so saw much the color yeah you everything. saw the soup was basically orange yeah the, the broth um they have a incredible resistance to bugs like incredible resistance to bugs and when it's hot on the hot minnesota summer i'm probably gonna stop picking porcini around this you know i have not been even looking for them because they're just going to be a, a maggot hotel lobster mushrooms they're just solid like a white baseball on the inside um and their weight they're yeah. super heavy you know, the good ones that we want to eat. You just you get a lot of yield. You can pick them quick. They got a good shelf life, and they dry well too. Mm-hmm. So and they're good for a lot of different things. And they just bulked out that soup, and it allowed us to it allowed us to feature the uh, the herisium, um, the toothed mushroom that we had, and the romaria 
but underneath it was supported by all of these like sort of quarter inch cubes of of really firm uh, lobster mushrooms. Yeah, because we nice. want everything to fit on the spoon. Yeah. But the lobster mushrooms are definitely the cannon fodder. In yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then with the uh, with the entree, then we had our pigeon breasts, and I was fighting with it a little bit. I was like, "How am I going to cook all of these skewers of pigeon and film?" and cook the soup, and do dessert, and speak, and do beauty shots of plates at the same time. It's like, oh man, this is, this is going to be a little tough. Um, so I wanted it to be, kind of have a primal edge to it. So Daniel carved, uh, we had to carve some skewers out of the apple tree, and I took a little thin slice of bacon I made from a lame ram we had on the farm. and I put Which is some- amazing, by the way. I just, I, it, it tastes like bacon. I was... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not expecting that. Yeah. Excited um, for that taking home. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have a bag. Give us a bag. To that's, well, remember, that's not my recipe. That's from the <laughs> farmers. It's it's still going to be good, and it's just ends in pieces. So remember, I, I dice it up. It's I don't so fatty, I don't eat it though. like a slice. Just, I was amazed. Oh yeah, it gives yeah. A, it gives good fat for you too. But I take a little slice of bacon, put it on a put it on the pigeon breast, and then take another pigeon breast, put a little thin slice of the bacon, and it's not like American bacon. American bacon is like cooking with smoke seasoning mm-hmm. i cook american bacon in water before i eat it because the smoke to is too strong off, yeah. yeah the smoke because it's and a lot of times it's synthetic uh, like liquid smoke then from there kind of compress the birds a little bit and it, we've brined them too which makes it so they can take a little bit they can take a little bit more punishment when they're on the grill and they're also going to be really tender no matter what Mm -hmm. so i'm kind of i was kind of hedging my bet a little bit there just to make sure that you know we're we're filming something it's going to look good either way but people are eating it and it needs to taste really good to them too Uh, then we we tip those guys with a skewer and just grill them just until they're barely cooked through and uh, we had a little salad of wild greens wait wait, we hit that that black cherry sauce though went on there and that was on the pigeon and that was yep, real yep, nice. yep. yeah we, f- we finished the dish with a, a i call it basically a gastric made from the wild black cherries you use choke cherries too or any kind of fruit that has a, a lot of pit proportionate to skin and flesh grapes where we're gonna, gonna have a great wild grape harvest and that'd be great with those too but i had a little bit of vinegar to give me leeway so that it doesn't have to be just a sweet compliment so we make a basically like a sweet and sour syrup out of the black cherries and after the pigeon comes off the grill we just kind of drizzle that dark black cherry sauce oh, over I them a little that. bit because the yeah, pigeon's got the color of duck already it's got mm-hmm. the color of a red meat and then with that black cherry sauce it's like that red with that darker red it just looks so nice you know and then we had a little salad of wild greens so that was lamb's quarters, gallon soga, burgundy amaranth, mallow leaves, chickweed, nasturtium. nasturtium flowers, comfrey flowers, sochan flowers, and just a little bit of uh, white wine vinegar, a touch of maple syrup, a pinch of salt, a touch of olive oil. And see, that's the other thing too: to make a wild, make a really good salad. Take all the bottled dressing and throw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. The best way to dress a salad, in my opinion, especially when you're working with these super fresh, super good plants, is oil in a separate container, your vinegar in a separate container, and a touch of salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. And you just add them a tiny bit to taste. I I don't usually use uh, the pre-made dressing. I, I do have some that I really, really like. Uh, but generally, that's the that's the one that I use. Yeah. And then we had yeah. uh, a little ga- the gallon soga rolls and the sunflower leaves. Oh yeah, that's a fantastic dish. Um, so that to me, I was saying to you, I felt like uh, to me, I was saying to you, I felt like uh, that's not a <laughs> anyway, I felt that I had a <laughs> full vegetable component to the dish in this tidy little package that when I sliced up you know, into these individual pieces, sort of like sliced, like, like the, you know, like a sushi roll has been cut up or something. Um, it just was such a clean way to eat the fiber component of the meal. I really like that. And, and I, and I also saw, and that was in sunflower leaves. That's a very approachable dish mm-hmm. for people, like a, a very approachable way to use that plant. It is. And it's a, it's, 
I'm going to have a lot of things in my book. They'll be in my book about, uh, you look at a lot of wild food books and it's like, okay, here's specific recipes for this species. You need to use this species. Here's specific recipes for this species. That's not how I cook. So I want things for people that are really approachable that everyone can use. Take some leaf, cook it. Take some plants, blanch them, chop them up. Mix some sort of binder. That could I like wild rice flour. You might use white rice flour. You could use ground up hot cereal. You, whatever you want. Mix it together, roll it up, steam it a little bit in a pan. You can use any, you know, cooked green that tastes good to you. And it doesn't have to be wild. If you're in the city, go get some charred leaves, go get some spinach leaves, whatever you want. But you can be creative with your with how you eat plants. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be species specific. And you call it the rouleau vert. The roulade vert. Roulade vert. Just uh, the fantastic. green, the green roll. The green roll. Yeah, it was yeah. it was really really nice. And then we finished off with uh, Dottie's uh, crisp as well. <laughs> Apple so crisp. there's like the family crisp uh, crisp recipe as well. So um, yeah, just an awesome dinner. And I was it was really nice to see that um, like everybody there really enjoyed the pigeon dish. You know. Yes. I, there's the there's thing. no like ew it's yeah, pigeon it's pigeon yeah, no, I know some of them are a little skeptical everybody was into it though I mean it was just eaten right up so anyway just well done man I just really impressed with the the whole experience of being here this week and um, we're taking back a lot of new knowledge with us and um, I also want to say uh, you have a really well curated uh, Instagram page oh thank you really nice and, and website. Uh, yeah, and well, we'll get to that, Grant. Slow down. <laughs> I want to start by saying go to Alan's. It's Forager Sh- at Forager Chef. At Forager Chef, yeah. Man, I can't believe you got those domains. That's amazing. Um, anyway, at Forager Chef. So go and follow that Instagram page, and you share quite a bit there. Um, that's a really educational page as well as like nice to look at and entertaining. So. Yeah, it's at, at first I said I'm never going to ever put a picture of a plate of food on here. Yeah, there's so there's so many feeds where it's just like play, my dinner. Look, my dinner. Look, my dinner. Look, my dinner. <laughs> and I said I'm never gonna do that. And th- now I will share a plate once in a while, like I just did yesterday. But I think there's more to uh, you know what we do than just how a plate looks and you know how you curate the plate. And you know, like I said, the puree here, the twiggy thing over here. There's more than that. And I try to have it be kind of like an ingredient focused yeah, series. That's what I like about it. Yeah. Yeah, if you're a forager, the, it's a really useful page. I mean, you're really at the forefront. You're part of that vanguard of what's happening in the foraging world. And um, so it's a really useful page for people who are looking for the education on that as well. And then um, tell us about what people would expect to find at foragerchef.com. Uh, you're going to find random experiments. You're going to find a lot of different ways to use funky mushrooms that you might find that are kind of out of the box. You're going to find the original recipes for things that are now heavily plagiarized by other people. <laughs> <laughs> My spruce tip ice cream kind of at the, at the forefront of that. Uh, you'll, you'll find different ways to, you know, to cook with plants. And also, you know, I'm a meat eater, so there's a meat component as well. There's a number of different videos. I do a video series uh, that we, we do grant work with uh, all on lamb and goat is I work with the lamb and goat farms. So I'm a huge proponent of, uh, you know, alternative meats, small game, sustainable ruminants, organ meat, you know, nose to tail eating, a lot of stuff like that. Well, it's a great page, and, and it's one of those pages that when I'm, um, you know, I bring home an ingredient and I'll just kind of do some searching around, like, hey, you know, what am I going to do with this? And then inevitably I end up on your webpage because you've already written something about it and uh, it's really useful to me. That happened with our groundhog recipe. Oh, I that's right. On, on Alan's page. But uh, yeah, I just really appreciate what you're doing for the world of foraging, man. It's great to call you a friend and to get to spend some time with you. And I'm um, really excited for people to get to see some of your work in the episode of Wild Fed. Um, Please get over to his webpage, get over to his Instagram, and uh, stay abreast of what he's doing, uh, because his book, Flora, coming out probably in another year and a half. Uh, It depends on how much I get done this winter, hopefully next fall, possibly the spring after that. I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, me too. Alan, thanks for having us out. Yeah, thanks Thanks so much, Alan. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, 
and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.